going to conferences all the time is the main uh, driver for for progress in your skill set and also your relationship and basically any any professional can become a better professional by attending conferences. It's not the standard, okay? It's a movie theater, but the uh, visual is great and the sound is great and um, I've seen a lot of uh, room and space so, and I think it's organized well. Seeing all the people here today and they're excited about stuff uh, and you can, you can see the energy and the, the, the desire to learn uh, and do new things. And I was positively surprised about the depth, the technical depth of the sessions and how that makes the tester part of the team. I think developers do benefit from coming to QA conferences, uh, just the same as testers can benefit from going to dev conferences. Um, you know, you've got to have a, a broad understanding of what's going on. It's really inclusive, I would say, um, like it's super diverse, people are really, really open and friendly, and it's really organized. Conferences are well worthwhile for, just for the ideas that they spark in people. When people come back to the office, they are, they're full of ideas and they're, they're all energized up. Hi, I'm Gil Tayar. I'm an architect and developer advocate at Ampli Tools, which is a company that does visual testing. I've been in back-end development as a developer in front-end, back-end, you name it, for so many years. Anyway, what I'm going to talk about is shift left, and not in the usual regular way, but how does shift left change the way you develop? It's not just another way of writing tests or who gets to write the tests, but it's more about how this changes the whole way you develop. See ya. And not a shift to the right. With your developer doing tests, your quality is tight. So let's release our product again. Let's do the shift left dance. Hi, I'm Gil. I'm Gil Tayar. Um, I go way back to the 80s, uh, really, really old. Um, I'm a developer. I was a developer. I am a developer and probably die a developer. Uh, one of the things I love so much is uh, is testing the code I write. I started it back in 2000 when I uh, um, 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 co-founded my, my own startup and built you know the dev team. And I decided, OK, developers need to test their own code. And I do it like for the last 20 years uh, diligently and always. I'm currently, because I love testing, I uh, joined Apple Tools three years ago as an architect and as a developer advocate. What Apple Tools does is deliver visual testing tools. Uh, if you want, if you're a front-end developer or you're QA and you're serious about visually testing your application, not only functionally testing them, please check out Apple Tools Eyes. Okay, what is software testing? Well, I copied this from Wikipedia and it's really boring, uh, not, not, not for me. For me, software testing is the art, and it's always an art, uh, the art of ensuring that changes in the code will not cause new bugs to appear. Wait just one sec. Let me put on the timer. There we go. Will not cause new bugs to appear. Changes will not cause new bugs. So let's talk about the changes. And I want to talk specifically not only about the changes, but the fear of adding changes to the code. I call that fear ego programophobia. Ego is me, like my me. Program is like code, and phobia is fear. Ego programophobia is fear of one's own code. And why do we fear our own code, code that we wrote? And the answer is, well, you know, when we're adding code to existing code of ours, then we tend to think of it as like, yeah, I'll just add the code and it'll work. We all know that the, you know, the reality is we add code and we tend to break things because it's never like just adding it. It's putting it in all the weird places and all the places in the code. It's never, it's like this. It's never like this. What about removing code? We tend to think of it as this surgical operation. Yeah, this if nobody really needs it, I can remove this function. I can remove this CSS rule. And we feel that it's like this surgical way of, of doing things. We just remove the code and everything still works. The reality is we never know why that if 
really is there. Uh, maybe we didn't think of something, or that CSS rule maybe affects other pages and not ours, and this is usually what we get when we remove code. And refactoring, refactoring is where we want to clean up the code, and we think of it as, yeah, I'll just go over and make it cleaner and simpler and nicer so that when I need other changes to the code, I'll be, it'll be simpler. The reality is once we start refactoring, we know how to start it. We never know how it's going to end. Okay, uh, so then, and so th this is why we fear code because changing the code may mean that new bugs to appear. We can't really grok how the how our changes affect the co the code, and we as developers do these things day in day out: add code, remove code, and refactor. That's what we do. That that's what we get paid for. So back in the days before. The shift left movement, uh, and, and, and still today, where uh, a lot of developers aren't writing tests, how do developers manage quality with so many frequent changes? That, that's a big, it's a big question. And the answer is, well, we didn't. We wrote the code, and because of the fear of our in inherent fear of our own code, we just threw it over the wall to QA. You test it. And it's literally throwing it over the wall because they get a product and we've like, yeah, we've tested it a bit, you, you know, tried the new features and tried some old features around it, but we throw it over the wall to QA to test everything because we know we could have, you know, um, done any re regressions. And this method of code, 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 and then throw it over the wall to QA, which ch checks for bug, it generated long release times, like months, sometimes even you know years or weeks. And it, it, because those long release times were there, we wanted to add as many features as we want, as we could for this release, because otherwise the release train will be like half a year in advance. So we got integration time, I, I like to call it crunch time, where everybody's working weekends and nights and everything to make the release happen. And it also began a good thing, automated testing, because the, the testers understood that they really can't deal with so many regressions, so they wrote tests that enable uh, um, testing it and not you know, wasting their time with, with uh, drudgery. And I want to zoom in on, on, on that specific piece, automated testing. Automated testing, who, who did that? Who wrote the tests? Because testing was done over the wall, developers didn't care. Ah, you know, testers will do it. So testers had no choice but to write the tests themselves. They couldn't get the developers to write them. But Testers have access only to the final product. If uh, those are testers up above, they can't really reach the modules, the specific modules and specific, test specific code. They can access the product only as a user or you know, one layer beneath uh, with API testing, which is a bit better, but not much better. They can only uh, test the app as a whole, okay? And these kinds of tests I like to call end-to-end -end tests. Some people call them uh, uh, system tests. Some people call them acceptance tests. The names are varied and, 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 and big. But the attributes of end-to-end -end tests are the same, whatever you call them. Uh, one, they're extremely slow. We're talking seconds per test, okay? Even tens of seconds for tests. And if I want to do a, a lot of permutations around them, like email validation of a, in, in a form, then, oh my God, that, that makes like minutes. And it's, they're difficult to test under extreme conditions like errors or load because errors are difficult to, uh, to generate. Um, because of the exceptions and low testing is difficult and they need a staging environment which is expensive to maintain nobody cares about it except the testers so it's badly maintained uh, it needs computers and everything and it's supposed to be like production but never is and it's never updated that's one problem. The other problem is that it's difficult to parallelize. If I want to run a lot of tests on the staging environment, it's very difficult, or create many testing environments for many different testing teams. Difficult. The worst is that they're flaky. You run 1,000 tests and 990 pass. 
those ten don't pass, and you have to go over the logs to figure out that ah, it's okay. It's just one of those things. The results are always statistical. But for a while, it worked. I mean, it was better than manual testing. But you know, people tend to remind us that for a while it worked, testers suddenly found that their whole job was automation. The only job they had was automation. And testing to make sure that this is a good product, it's like slipped from them. We'll talk about that later. So that was that. And then the internet came, like late 90s, early 2000s. And, and with the internet came what is called the internet time. Suddenly companies realized that they need to be agile. They need to release quickly, adapt to change, do things very, very quickly. They had to be agile, the companies. And they needed a short release cycle, not months, not even weeks, okay, even more. So basically, companies and developers and, and testers understood that they need to get rid of the friction that there is in the development cycle. And that cycle where developers work, 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 like for you know three weeks a month and throw it to the cute testers and, and you know over the wall and the testers come with bugs and the developers fix and blah, blah, blah. That doesn't help re remove friction or generate a slow uh, release cycle, a fast release cycle. It doesn't help. So what did they do? What, what did we do? Okay, remember I, I started doing developer testing in early 2000s, so I was probably one of the first. Well, we let our developers test. Um, and, and let's talk about the mindset and the tools that developers and testers have when writing automated tests. First of all, testers. Testers don't have access to the code. And they can test applications only from the outside. And they must, so they must do end-to-end -end So they're like, oh, okay, well, do we have no choice. Long suites of tests that take like 30 minutes or an hour. Developers have access to the code, can test the application from the inside, so can take a module or a microservice or whatever. And they love fast because they need to commit. And they really, really want to check push. They really, really want to check every push and every commit that they have. So they want their test to be fast, like on the order of seconds or like very few minutes. So they preferred a new kind of test, which we'll talk about in a second. We, we call them unit and integration tests. And shift left started happening. And it's happening all the while. More and more companies are moving to the shift left where the tests are moving to developers and less to the testers. And I'm not a big fan of this way. This way is like quantitative. It says, yeah, it's the same test, but they're moving to developers. Nothing changed except who's doing the tests. No, I think we can do better. Because a good shift should be qualitative, not just quantitative. Not only who does the test, but maybe the whole way of thinking about development needs to change. And we'll talk about that. So shift left, as we will see, should change the way development and deployment are done. But, you know, first of all, shift left means one thing. Testing is not done by developers, but testing should become a part of the development process and not an outside thing. So if you're a developer and you're writing, writing, writing your code, and then you're writing, writing, writing all the tests after a month, that's not shift left. Well, it is, but not as it's not as good as the correct shift left, which we'll see. So it means that one, two things. Shift left means two things. One, developers should write the test for every piece of code they write, not after a month, immediately. Okay, it doesn't matter. Well, we'll talk that. And the second thing, this is the quantitative change. This is the shift left, but it also means and it, and, every, and as something else. Every push should be ready for deployment. And that is a qualitative change, and we'll see why. Let's talk about the first. Developers should write tests for all the code they write. This is the quantitative part of shift left. Let's talk about what tests they're writing and understand from them how, why the whole thing is a change, and it's not just who's writing the test. First of all, developers write unit tests, and all developers write unit tests. A lot of times I speak to developers, are you writing tests? And they say, yes, we're writing tests. And they, like, they feel very happy. And I ask them, and they're writing just unit tests, which is great. It's a good start, but it's not enough. But first of all, what are unit tests? It's code tests 
that write the test only one class, one function, one module, or one UI component, maybe two or three, but nothing more. They're focused, they're laser focused on a specific functionality in the code. It's not all the code. And they're great. But unfortunately, that's where most developers stop, and it's not enough. Why? Because most of our code is glue code. Each unit can run separately and work OK. But tie together all the units, and you get the, you know, the, the meme where the units work, but tied together, it just doesn't fit. OK. And, and, and that happens again and again and again and again. So what developers do, if they go above the unit test, and they should, they must, they write integration tests where they take a lot of units and put them together. If it's front end, they take test a whole page, not all the pages, not it, not with the back end, just the page. If it's back end, they test like uh, a whole microservice or a whole set of APIs together with 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 the with the back end. So a whole a set of units functioning together. Okay, this is integration tests. Let's not forget the visual aspects because visual is important. Um, if you're testing functionality, you're basically not testing your CSS and HTML. And functionality can fail from time to time. But remember, the visuals can also fail. If you remove that rule from CSS and didn't notice that it you know, affects other pages, all your other pages will be bad, will look bad while their functionality continues working. What about the whole app? So we talked about unit, we talked about integration, but what about testing the whole app? How does it function well together? That's where end-to-end -end tests come. And end-to-end -end tests is the same as in, in the testers. We deploy the whole application to a testing environment and write a test that automates it using a browser or a mobile device, just like a user would. As we said, end-to-end -end tests are slow and flaky, difficult to reproduce production, and in a microservices environment where I, I don't really want a testing environment. I want to run everything on my computer. This is a developer we're talking about. And doing that, running the whole product on a, on a computer, sometimes can work, a lot of times doesn't. So we've seen the, the whole developer testing thing. We've seen unit, we've seen integration, we've seen end-to-end. -end. Somebody that wants to get and manage that shift left needs guidelines. It's not just telling the developer as well, now you write your tests. It's telling them these are the guidelines you should follow. And these are my guidelines. I mean, I'm sure if you go to another developer that does tests or to a consultant, they will have different guidelines. But hey, I'm getting the keynote, not them. So. First of all, we already talked about that. Do not do just unit testing, okay? Developers should own all of their tests, including the end-to-end, -end, including the integration. Do not leave anything to the testers. And if you do have testers, most, you, most of you do, as, as do we, make sure that they get a working product so that they can test it correctly. And we'll talk about the role of testers in a second, okay, in, 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 in a shift left environment. But testers need to get a working product. So your test should be comprehensive and cover everything. Let's talk about three main schools of tests. OK, so I, I, okay, I, I need to cover everything. How do I do that? Unit, integration, end-to-end, -end, a lot of end-to-end, -end, less end-to-end, -end, more integration. What's the melange of the three? There are three schools. One is pyramid. Lots of unit tests, a lot less integration, and very few end-to-ends. That's the pyramid school, obviously, because of the pyramid. Everybody knows about this. What I call the diamond school is lots of integration. That's the, where the most important thing, that's the bulk and the weight of your tests. A few unit tests where it makes sense and very few end-to-end -end tests. And there's the hexagonal architecture, which has its own testing methodology. I'm putting it here for completeness, but I don't really understand it, so I will skip. Let's talk about the pyramid. Why is it good? Why is it bad? The pyramid discusses, well, if you go up the pyramid, okay, before we discuss it, the higher you go up, the more confidence you get. Here, sorry. The more confidence you get, because then if you have all end-to-end -end tests and all the end-to-end -to -end tests pass, you know your product is working. But if you have just unit tests, well, you don't really know. 
So the higher you go up, the more confidence you have, but the, slow, the slower your test suite works and the flakier it is. So the pyramid emphasizing unit tests, lots and lots and lots of unit tests. And from their point of view, if you add just a few integration tests, that's okay and it will work. They get immense speed. And the way you test unit tests, by the way, is you use a lot of mocking because if you, if you use one unit and it's using another unit, you can't add it because you'll need to add a third, et cetera. So you mock it. So lots of mocking. And that's when people do a lot of unit tests, they get immense speed. So their test suite runs like in one minute, the whole thing or like 30 seconds or 20 seconds, but less confidence and much more uh, mocking. And they do integration tests because they're not stupid <laughs> and much less end-to-end. -end. As I said, developers are, uh, don't like end-to-end -end tests and, and, and I think rightfully so. The diamond says, oh, let's take a middle path. Integration today, it used to be that integration tests were very slow. Integration tests today are really, really fast. You can do, you can use Docker and JS DOM and all kinds of techniques to make your integration tests almost as fast as unit. So you get the speed and you get the confidence. So bulk is there. This is what I am using at Apple Tools and what a lot of my friends are using, more integration, less unit. Unit makes sense in the classic cases where if you have a function like validate email, well, you know, you can generate a hundred tests with, with all the you know variations of emails, and that's perfect for a unit. Definitely not for integration. Which is better, like diamond, uh, uh, pyramid, whatever uh, else you concoct? And and the answer is, hey, don't ask me. It's a religion. Try them out. See what you like best. I am not there. I know people that do this and I know people that do that. But the commonalities are there. The need for speed, like if you're doing uh, uh, lots of integration tests and integration tests test a microservice, then that those integration tests for that microservice should take like roughly one minute, three minutes, around that area, nothing more. Uh, test all layers of code. Everybody says integration unit and end-to-end -end, and very few end-to-end -end tests. This is common for all the, uh, the pyramids or diamonds or whatever. Let's continue with the guidelines. Um, for guidelines, there are fanatics out there, really. Believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in this area. And I've he heated the arguments with a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, testing fans. Listen to them. They have a lot of really good things to say, but don't listen to the fanatic part of it. Choose your own path. Choose your own testing strategy. And one of the fanatics is TDD fanatics. For them, it's the only, well, for a lot of them, not all, that's not fair. It's the only true uh, way to do that. No, it doesn't. I'm not using TDD, and I think my tests are really good. It could be. If you like it, a lot of people like it. It's very orderly, very simple. There's a rhythm to it that's wonderful. Okay, But it doesn't have to be TDD. I'm, I don't use it. Always true. Write as few tests as possible. Don't go for 100% coverage. It's a myth. And too many tests are a problem. So how many? And the answer is enough tests to abolish your fear of deployment. No more. Okay? Don't add just because you can. And you can. And, and how do you know how much? Okay? How do you know you've gotten to the limit? And the answer is for me is the shako meter. It's, it's this uh, a machine I built where you strap it to your wrist. And when you go and press the enter for deploy, okay, it test your shakiness. If you're shaking too much, it's like with red and you go back and you do not deploy and you write more tests, check it more. And once you go back to that enter, your hand is not shaking anymore. I, obviously, I don't have that machine, but the idea is that you know when you have enough tests or not. So use that knowledge, that intuitive, intuitive knowledge uh, to to do that. And remember, tests grow with time. Don't try to write test all the tests at once. Let your production show you where to add tests. So, if so a user finds a bug, doesn't happen a lot when you, when you have a lot of tests, but users do find bugs. And you suddenly see that a lot of bugs are centered around this microservice or this functionality. So you add more, you take more care to add tests around that functionality, whereas other functionalities you know are okay, they're simple. You write tests for them always, but you don't have to go overboard. And remember, for every bug in production, add a test, almost no uh, exceptions. 
test manually as little as possible. Okay, as a developer at Apple Tools, because we're doing backend, we never test manually. We never run the application in right, like do use Postman to check it. Never, never. If I write a, a feature, okay, or do a refactoring, I write the tests then and there to check that feature. Once they're done and all the tests pass, I just deploy the microservice to production. I have never tested in at Apple Tools manually that, that microservice. I check the features through the tests. And this forces me and my team and a lot of developers I know that use this in a way to write tests. I have no choice but to write tests because there's no other way. It's more difficult with front-end code, but it's still possible in like 90%. Um, Definitely done that as a front-end uh, developer. Uh, more difficult, but still doable. You need a lot of willpower. OK, let's say you don't have a lot of tests. You don't have good coverage as a developer. Well, what do you do? So first of all, no big project. No, yeah, well, let's stop development. And we're going to work for like three months and write all the tests. Just no. No, no, no. Start small. Let it grow with time. Let's say you want to add a feature. Write tests for that feature, OK? Uh, add another feature, write test for that feature. Do a refactoring, write test for that area, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes go back and write some tests, a few. After a year or two, yes, it's a, not a sprint. It's a marathon. It takes time. After a year or two, you go and look, and you say, hey, I've got really good test coverage. Thanks, Gil. Oh, oh and, and start with one big end-to-end -end test, which you should write for, you know, for that confidence that it gives. OK, that's, that's the quality, quantitative part of, of shift left. What about the quality part of shift left? How it changes your whole development process? And the answer is every push you do, every commit, basically, should be ready for deployment. Because you need to realize the truth. There is no release anymore. Uh, you release features. You don't release releases. OK, if you're truly working agile, you only release features. You write the feature, release, done, boom, done, boom, done, boom, done. There is no release per se. Sometimes there are. Um, I, I don't want to go into that. But even if there is, you need to think as if there isn't. Because the QA gateway must die. The idea that you write, 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 write code and somebody approves of that, that must die. And why? Um, safety nets. You should assume that there are no safety nets between your push and production. I know it's crazy, but think of a bowling alley. Okay, bowling alley, you have these bumpers. Bumpers are testers. Bumpers are QA. Bumpers are the QA gateway. And you know you can just throw it wherever, and it'll be okay. It'll reach the destination. But you won't score a lot of quality points because you're not aiming. But if there are no bumpers, then you start aiming correctly and you start getting those strikes and spares. Okay. And 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 obviously there are cases where Testers need to get in, like very, very sensitive, very, very difficult. But those are the exceptions, not the rule. So how do we do that? How do we ensure that every push can be deployed to production? And the answer is only one master branch. Don't do feature branches. And if you'd like them, do them short-lived, like a day or two, not, not, not much more. Deploy in small deltas. Push in small deltas. If you have a big feature, Push it piecemeal-wise, just a little bit of it, and a little bit of it, and a little bit of it, slowly, slowly, and use feature flags, OK, to uh, use feature flags to hide the feature from the user. If you're doing backend, you don't really need feature flags, or almost don't, OK? But in, in front end, it's more complicated, as usual. Big commits should be taboo. Big pushes should be taboo. Why? Because big commits generate a lot of bugs. And I run a build and test CI process on every push so you'll know that your tests are running and everything is fine. And deploy all the time. Uh, we deploy like five, six, seven, eight times a day. And, and this is important. When, when, when I have some code that is too much time on my machine, I get you know, like, Gerald, I don't know if it's running. And how do I know it's running besides the test? I push to production. And obviously, sometimes we need to roll back, and we have a very fast rollback procedure, obviously. But that happens also when QA runs. But because the deltas are small, OK, because the deltas are small, uh, OK, so, and, and, and uh, sorry, sorry, because the deltas are small, 
I know if there is a problem in production, I know where that code happened because I just pushed it, okay? But if you want, you know, a lot of releases, a lot of deploys, you have to have developers to write tests and have good coverage. The shako meter should be green all the time. And this is where the shift left ends and where the qualitative change happens because small deltas with developer tests mean less bugs. And why? First of all, developers don't ignore their own test failures, never. So if a test fails, they'll check it. If it's a bug in the test, they'll fix it. If it's a flakiness, they'll fix it. And if it's a real bug, they'll fix the bug. And when a bug sometimes passes through the test, it happens. It happens whether there are developer tests or whether there aren't. But in when there aren't, and there's this huge commit, like months of commit or two weeks or three weeks, they don't know what caused it because there's a huge amount of delta between the le this release and that release. But if the delta is like 30 lines of code, then, well, they very quickly understand what the problem is. They can either roll back and just fix it or just fix it. Developers, because they have this push small deltas thing, they like refactoring suddenly. They refactor more and clean code means less bugs. So small deltas and developer tests means true agility true agility and that you can push features very, very quickly because you have less friction. You can code very quickly, you can work very quickly, you can deploy very quickly, you're more responsive to change and less time developers spend on production bugs, okay? Because they have less bugs and, and really it's true. I mean, it sounds like snake oil, but it's not snake oil because it needs a lot of work to get to that point. But less time developers spend on production bugs means more time on refactoring, on clean coding, on adding features. Okay, but what, what, what about testers? What, what, fire them all? No, no. What is the world, if, if developers write the bulk of the tests, what is the role of testers? But let's think what happens when the testers write all those tests, okay? Developers that don't shift left basically rely on testers to find the regression bugs for them. So testers are busy dealing with taking a product that just came out of the developer oven, and it's not really working. We all know that, okay? Because testers didn't test, uh, developers didn't test. And so they're constantly running the regressions and figuring out what the bug is and talking to developers and all that takes a lot of time and they don't have time to do their real job which is not ensuring that the product works. That's the problem with developers, ensuring the product is good. Or to put it bluntly, and I will read this line by line, when developers deliver a working product to testers, then testers can do the job they were meant to. The job is quality assurance and not covering the developer's asses. And this, what is that job? Mentoring on testing, mentoring developers on testing, mentoring testers on testers, pre-deployment smoke tests, test, smoke tests that run constantly in production and check that everything's fine. Manual testing in production, I can do manual testing and find the bugs before our users find them. And because I'm using production, I'm using a real environment with the real bugs. And I can do exploratory testing and find those really weird bugs. And UX testing, is this, UI intuitive? Does it work nicely? Does it make sense? And yes, those automation tests that are really, really difficult. Sometimes you need the testers to do that because they have the capability. And the list goes on and on and on and on. There's so much work for testers to do. And if developers start writing tests, this will free the time for the, the testers to do what they were initially supposed to do. Ha! Huh. Long road. In summary, Shift left quantitatively. There's two shift lefts. First of all, shift left quantitatively, shifting tests to developers. That's what most people focus on. It's very important, very, very important. Developers have the advantage of the access to the code and they need to test all the layers, unit integration and end-to-end, -end, but as few end-to-end -end as possible. They need to uh, use that advantage to write a lot of unit and integration tests. And how many tests? That's where the shako meter and the confidence of the test coverage comes from. But the more important thing, once you reach that point of shift left, you start seeing the qualitative change, the rapid small delta releases. And to do that, you have one master branch 
okay? And the master branch, a push to the master branch should always be ready for production. And each push should automatically be tested using the developer tests and push to production, boom, boom, boom. And once you have that, you have less friction, less bugs, more easily fixable bugs, and much more agile process. And shift left also means that testers can do finally what they were always supposed to do, make the product better. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we have time for, we have actually a lot of time for, oh, for questions. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Oh, nice. Thank you, everybody. Um, how to measure the coverage of unit integration and end-to-end -end tests. Without knowing the coverage, you won't be able to see how your pyramid diamond look like. Well, pyramid diamond is the amount of unit and end-to-end -end tests. You can easily track that with, you know, a rough, a rough estimate is lines of code. But how do you estimate the coverage? There are coverage um, tools out there. Uh, in JavaScript, it's, uh, what's its name? I don't remember. Uh, and in Java, there are every, 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 every language has its own tools. I'm not a fan. I've never used it. And people who have used it always complain. Um, I, as I said, the shakeometer, the intuitive understanding of how many uh, um, um, t tests, you know, it's uh, people don't like this answer. What do you mean intuition? But what if that developer is like bad and uh, whatever? No, it works. It works because if that bug appears in production, it's that developer's ass on the line. So suddenly coverage, they get a grasp, an intuitive grasp of how much they need. So yeah, and it's a weird answer, but I think it's the correct answer. And most people I've talked to like that answer, most developers do. Okay, ooh, we're going up. Okay, uh, this is an, uh, an awesome presentation. Is it possible you share it with us? I would love to. I think everybody has shared and it's being recorded and the first slide uh, is uh, is has a link to that to that uh, presentation. Thank you, Antonia. Antonia, yes. Okay. Do testers need to ask developers to do unit testing? Uh, I, I this is a this is a culture thing. Uh, my point was that developers should be doing uh, um, the unit testing and not so much testers. But if you're talking about collaborative, I think yes, because you're entering the domain of developers. So they should be, um, 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 uh, there should be some kind of agreement between developers and testers to do that. But that's common courtesy and not so much a technical question or a culture question. Okay, next. Uh, can you add uh, your unit test and integration test to your automated end-to-end -end run? Not all of them, of course, but the most common. Actually, it should be the exact opposite. The unit and integration and the small end-to-end -end tests are your, should be your main thing because they give you the coverage that you need and the confidence that you need. And if you want, sometimes you can run your long test suite like nightly or once every few days. But the unit integration should all be run always because they're very, very fast and very, very important for coverage and for confidence. How to convince developers to do unit and integration testing? I, I don't know. One, well, you can ask them to join Ampa Tools. We always do that. You can show them this presentation. And I think, like, if I talked five or 10 years uh, ago, it was like nobody wanted to do that. Today, it's different. Uh, today, more and more developers want to do that and feel the pressure, like the, the peer pressure to do that because it's like already like best practices. I think it's be better, easier to do that now, but I've always worked with developers that wanted to do, uh, um, so sorry, can't, can't answer more. Uh, how much basic QA should know uh, or have a visibility about tests done by developers? Should we share the same testing platform? Should we have list dev tests? Well, I think automated testing, most of it, like the bulk, 90% should be owned by developers. So that question should be to the developers owning that. 
Okay, but if you're in a mixed environment where both developers and QA do, do that, I don't know, I've never been in such an environment. Intuitively, I would make them together so that we can you can share the work and work together, but I wouldn't like do common code around that or anything, just, you know, the same repo or, or something like that. I know integration tests are becoming, hi, Lauren, I know that integration tests are becoming more important, especially in serverless apps. Is the diamond shape test a standard term or something you coined? Uh, I'm sorry, it's something I've coined. Uh, Kent Dodds calls it the trophy of testing uh, because it looks like a trophy. He has this nice, uh, uh, but it's definitely something I've coined. But uh, there's this very famous tweet by Guillermo Rausch, which is uh, um, write tests, not too many, mostly integration. So, and I've talked to a lot of developers. So the, the standard term today is mostly integration tests. I like the idea of diamond, but it's definitely something I've coined. Any tips for how to educate business people to do bath testing in different way when trying to use shift left testing? I'm sorry, I do not know what bath testing is. Uh, uh business people oh i have a whole talk about how to educate business people about the importance of developer testing and about testing in general and the gist of it is take the qualitative part of my talk which is once developers start testing you have less friction and you have more agility agility is a product thing agility is a business thing and that is something that convinces business people to help with that uh, so good and inspired presentation. Thank you from Estonia. Thank you from Israel. Uh, so yeah, I'd uh, love to visit uh, one day. Uh, how do you imagine testers working besides catching bugs? Well, I had a whole, you know, one or two uh, slides on it, but it's basically doing what they were used to doing, which is exp not, not, they should be catching bugs, okay? But the weird ones, not the regression ones that shouldn't have been left developers. We're talking exploratory, manual, uh, UX testing. There are so many ways to catch bugs beside writing a, a more and more automation tests that are much more easily wrote, written by developers. Uh, why, while talking about shift left in most cases, most of cases are being described only developers' work changes. What about other types of testing after system testing? Well, Shift left is like moving the tests to developers. So the things that you do after system testing, first of all, system testing is, is not shift left because it's uh, testers writing the tests. So it's definitely not shift left. Uh, but after system testing is even like writer than that. So it's definitely not shift left. Uh, how do you calibrate your fear of deployment across the team to determine how many tests write? Well, hi, Lauren. Oh, you're back. Uh, and and the answer is, I don't know. Um, hire good people. There's no metric. There's no good metric. It's just like the lines of code metric that people tried to do, and it obviously it never worked. Uh, so you know, I don't know. Um, intuition. Find the right people. Find the right team leaders. Uh, okay. Why while telling about shift left? In most cases, uh, oh, wait, I, I, I read that. Nice talk, thanks. Uh, oh, we're good. I have a bit of off-topic question. I see that you're probably a guitar player. <laughs> Not me, it's my son. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, test of music or a song. I have no, that's an interesting one. Uh, but it's not me, it's my son. I, I, I play the piano. Uh, the whole thing is my son's uh, room. I'm in my son's room. Okay, uh, just wanted to add something um, to the whole thing. Um, um, people ask me, these were the talks of the first conference day. I'm, I'm, I'm ending it. Thank you very much. It was really, really fun, the whole conference. I hope you had a really productive day. Uh, tomorrow, 9 a.m. Uh, Lithuania time, where Bjorn Boyshot will open the second day with a talk called DevOps Test Alone. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.